you've been doing all this traveling. Your focusing has your focus has been on global security, trying to understand what is happening in the world because there does seem to be a very significant shift, especially with the pandemic. And now we're seeing food security become a very serious issue. And you're in Netherlands right now. So what are you seeing? Netherlands right now is about to go into winter. Their energy prices are going through the roof. Uh, and uh, and uh, most of the people don't see the famine coming. Uh, some do. Uh, and so as we can see, Germany is about to collapse under the, the burden of uh, lack of energy, not just energy prices. And so the, the farmers are being uh, destroyed and, uh, and, and Netherlands is being brought to heel under the, under the globalists. Some are resisting. So basically you're saying that the Dutch government has a globalist bent. Oh, big time. I mean, I wouldn't say they just have a globalist bent. They are globalist. The farmers own about 62% of the land in Netherlands, but they're the, the, this is the second largest food exporter in the world, despite being only less than 18 million people, right? And the farmers are extraordinary. And so they're, they're using excuses of what they call stickstoff here, which is nitrogen, that the nitrogen is causing pollution right next door in Germany, which is on the border. They don't ever bring up the nitrogen. They blame CO2 over there. Across the border, it's CO2. Here, it's nitrogen. They just, you know, the, the globalists just tailor make their, their, uh, their talking points to, to, to resonate with people. But the bottom line is they're trying to run the farmers out of business by saying that they're polluting the, the environment. And of course, that means that they're, who's going to make this food? When you take the most efficient farmers in the world, arguably, and you put them out of business uh, because they're polluting, who's going to do it? The Indians, the Chinese? I don't know. Uh, the bottom line is, though, we can see that we're going into an energy crisis that is quite severe. Uh, and uh, an energy crisis, of course, leads to food crisis as well. Uh, as you know, I spent a lot of time down in the Darien Gap between Colombia and, and, uh, and Panama. A great deal of time out with those uh, Indians deep in the jungle, taking two congressmen down there. Uh, Tom Tiffany from Wisconsin, for instance, very courageously went probably 25 miles out in the jungle with me. And, uh, and then, you know, Mexico and whatnot. You see our borders just being overwhelmed. Same is happening here in Europe. Uh, I was just over in Luxembourg, tiny country, and about 50% of the country is now uh, recent migrants, right? Luxembourg is not anything like it was the last time I was there. In fact, Europe in general is not. I've lived six years in Europe, mostly Germany and Poland. And you can see, for instance, Germany is, is really going downhill fast. Uh, they have an energy crisis that is quite severe, and it's been exacerbated by the war in Ukraine, of course, you know, you've got Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2. For people that don't know what that means, there's two pipelines. Nord Stream means North Stream because the pipeline goes through the, the Baltic Sea and comes down to Germany, right? So Nord Stream 2 has never been opened because Germany won't certify it to open. Nord Stream 1 has been open and running at 100% until recently, until the war came. And uh, excuse me if you see flies here, there's horses everywhere. I'm in farmland. Nord Stream 2 has never been open. Nord Stream 1 is very vital for, for, for Germany and Europe uh, because that's where a huge amount of the natural gas comes to Germany, right, and, and other parts of Europe. And, and since the war started, Nord Stream 1 was flowing at 100%, and then Putin knocked it down. I mean, I'll, I'll skip some of the details, but he had to flow down to about 22% for, for quite a while. I've been watching it every few days. There's an online website. You can see the flow yourself. Putin had threatened uh, weeks ago that he would shut off Nord Stream 1 and put it down to zero, in which he just did. I was up after midnight watching the flows, and sure enough, he shut it off. And, uh, and so now, this is a big deal. At the current burn rate, even when Nord Stream 1 was at 22%, uh, which it is at 0% as we talk right now, right? Uh, that means that Germany was probably going to run out of energy or of natural gas in about January or February, height of the winter, and Germany's quite cold, as you know. And now this has other huge effects besides just freezing to death. Right now, Germany is setting up warming stations, by the way, in school gymnasiums and whatnot, so that 
come winter time, people will be able to warm up in, in, the, in the gymnasiums and that the German tribes will be able to meet with the new Somali tribes who have come in. Uh, so, I mean, it, it'll be quite interesting. And so, but a huge impact, and we'll get back to food now, uh, of, the, of the natural gas. As you know, natural gas is used to make nitrogen-based fertilizers using the Haber-Bosch process. The Haber-Bosch process takes natural gas and converts it using atmospheric air it combines those together, and you make ammonia, urea, or ammonium nitrate, and some other things. And this is vital. This process is absolutely vital for the lives of billions of people on Earth. The Haber-Bosch process has only been around for roughly 110 years, uh, and that is one of the things that allowed the human population to just explode. I've published on my locals a number, number of times a map of the fertilizer plants that have either shut down production of nitrogen-based fertilizers uh, or have greatly uh, reduced the amount. Now the flash to bang on the, on, the, on the food issues is quite long because we're living off of last year's bounty right now, right? And so there was a lot of fertilizer in, and food already in the pipeline, which is now draining just like Nord Stream 1 just did. And so the pipeline is now draining out Fertilizer is not being produced anywhere close to what it used to be. As you know, China and other countries like India, Malaysia, Indonesia are hoarding food, uh, which is, I think, quite smart. I mean, for, from their perspective, they may be having riots today in China, uh, un, unconfirmed, but it, it looks like it. Food riots uh, in Chengdu, we'll, we'll, we'll see. But the bottom line is, I would not doubt it if you have actual Germans knocking on your door this year because they're freezing. Now, there is plenty of natural gas. Russia has obviously plenty. Netherlands, where I'm sitting now, there's a place called Groningen, which is not very far from me, about an hour away. They've got all the natural gas they need for Netherlands, and substantial part they could uh, send quite a lot to, to Germany. Uh, and also over in the UK, they've got a lot of natural gas that's not being used. And it's not being used because it's sitting in the ground due to information campaigns by the Greens and the people who sponsor the Greens. So it's just, people are gonna freeze to death this winter. It's very clear. Next year, we're going to start to see profound food shortages, and this will drive that hop. We see right now, going through South America, through Colombia, up through the Darien Gap, where I spend so much time, the flows are dramatically increasing. And as you know, I was down in Darien Gap a few months ago. Darien Gap is that uh, jungle gap between Colombia and Panama. It's very rugged, very dangerous. So the migrants go through the Darien Gap, and, and many are drown or fall off what they call the Montaña de la Muerta, the mountain of death, or they get lost out there. But they're coming up in massive numbers through Africans and Asians. I see people from Pakistan every day. I'm talking about in Panama, in Central America, right? I see uh, that that flow is dramatically increasing as we see the economies collapse, right? Like last year, I didn't see many Pakistanis. I see a few, a sprinkling. Last year, I didn't see many. I didn't see any Chinese. I heard about Chinese. This year, I see seeing mainland Chinese every day. Mainland Chinese go to Ecuador, and then they go up to Colombia, go into the Darien Gap, and, and go north, and they end up all around the United States. And so we have the same with uh, Indians, Bangladeshis, Somalis, Yemenis, over 140 countries, right? And so this human osmotic pressure that's being created by these food shortages that are coming in a huge way next year sets up South America as a funnel right through Panama. I'm a war correspondent, right? I'm down there because that is a corridor north. And recently when I was down there, Mayorkas came and landed in his Blackhawks. He came with three Blackhawks and he's doubling the size of the camps that we're increasing the flow. Our own government is, is increasing the, 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 the migration flow, like opening the arteries, right? In the past, most of the flows were coming from what we call the Northern Triangle, like Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, Mexico. It's not really a triangle. But now, there, many people are coming from uh, huge numbers from Cuba, huge numbers from uh, Haiti. Haiti's just dumping out through there. Venezuela, of course, left wing has collapsed. Colombia has just gone left wing. So now I'm seeing Colombians go through there all the time, every day. Peruvians, like last year, I wasn't seeing any Peruvians. This year, I'm seeing Peruvians down the Darien Gap.